Okay, so um, I wanted uh, to understand. Can you uh, can you close the door over there? I wanted to go through this paper for a while. It came out uh, long ago. Um, 2022 was the first idea, and then uh, they published another uh, paper in 2023 last year at IPLEAR, that's in May. Uh, and I think the ideas that are here interesting to what we do, uh, like they're relevant the whole interpretability angle, and um, they're different from what we do and how we do. So progress measures for grokking via mechanistic interpretability. Pretty much every word in the title uh, could be and should be explained. I will give uh, my talk is as usually the uh, it continuous transition of my fully prepared uh, incoherent talks. So my slides are only for the introduction, and then I will flip through the paper. I'll uh, try to um, figure out with you what's going on in the paper. Um, so mechanistic interpretability, what is that? And then croaking, uh, what, what are we talking about? And then progress measures. So mechanistic interpretability, there, there's um, uh, the field of um, explainable AI is relatively new if we're talking about deep learning, but all the time when we're working with data, starting from Fisher, uh, Pearson, 1920s, we're trying to explain the world. We're trying to build scientific models or mechanistic models of what's going on uh, anyways. But the way we approached or the, the way the field started, at least um, the way that is the most popular is on the left. Uh, it's uh, when we're trying to explain the data. The language is fluid and some people like interpretable, what is interpretable, what is explainable. I am not claiming uh, I know the ground truth or I'm uh, you know imposing any terms, but I suggest, and that is what I will stick to, I will use uh, explainable AI or explanations when we explain the data. So here's the data set. The model made a prediction on this data set, oh, on this data sample. Uh, what is the reason for that data sample to be uh, predicted one way or another? And that's explainable AI. Mostly those are, they're also, those methods are called uh, post hoc interpretability. Uh, but again, we will not use that word here. I want to separate what is interpretability, what is explanation. So explainable is, um, give me a sample. Do you see my mouse? Clearly. Uh, okay. Say if the model predicts that this is a person with a tie, then the model shows us. Looking at those pixels, I made this prediction. Those, those are the defining pixels. Lots of people claim, and there are lots of published research that uh, these methods are unstable meaningless, etc., etc. <laughs> there are many problems with that. For this talk, for this paper, we don't care about it. We talk, uh, we care about interpretable models. What we mean by interpretable models is that this each point here is a multidimensional data set. Could be 256 cube brain image. Could be whatever, um, um, an image from Cypar, which is much smaller dimension. We do not know anything about the data. What we know by looking at this, we know what is the algorithm trying to do. And their algorithm is trying to minimize total list squares or is finding a PCA uh, fit. It's fitting um, a line by minimizing total list squares. That is interpretability. We understand what model is doing. That, that's that's what I will be calling inter interpretability, and that's what mechanistic interpretability in this paper is about. So uh, when you understand what the model is doing, then uh, we assume that's interpretable. Of course, like if you come, if you go to the farmer's market and grab a random person, 
and tell them, hey, um, linear regression is such a simple, the most interpretable model. Can you explain it to me in a couple of words? Unlikely uh, people will be able to do that. So when uh, again, you still need years of education to understand and be, to interpret, but that's still, at least we mean it's uh, humanly capable uh, that, okay, I can I can understand, or okay, I can teach someone maybe with years of education or after years that they will say, oh yeah, I understand what, it, what it's doing. So here's a simple homework problem. Uh, the homework problem from neural networks 101. So implement a recurrent neural network, which implements binary addition with carry. So the inputs are given as, as binary sequences, starting with the least significant digit. But the key here, so, okay, what we want, we want this binary number plus this binary number uh, result in this binary number. That is a, the correct addition. But in the representation to the recurrent neural network, we want to go backwards, one and zero. So input one is one, input uh, zero is zero. So we're going backwards from the least significant to the most significant digits. Like we, we do addition in grade school by adding, and then if there is a carry, we keeping it and adding it and adding. So, um, and generating a correct output, there will always be say um, digit that is one longer than the sequence of the, of the, the, the binary each of the binary sequences that you add, it will be either zero, means nothing, or one, right? But uh, if there is a carry, like you carry it over um, one tradition. So one uh, caveat also only that in this homework problem, you're not allowed to train anything. You need to just set the values of the weights manually. So you need to look at the problem understand what you would do or what this mechanism would do or needs to do. And th this is a pro uh, problem that I gave in one of my classes as a homework. Uh, with Marinal uh, was my TA, we were doing it. So after struggling with this problem for a bit, we decided to give it for extra credit. Okay, not to torture uh, the, the kids uh, with, the, with this. But anyways, um, the, the trick is, okay, you have a recurrent neural network and your recurrent neural network, by you setting the weights manually, luckily they're integer, and then you just set the weights, what they should be in this model, what is the U, what is the W, just define them, and then you understand, okay, well, I totally understand, uh, well, uh, not just the mechanism of what is happening, but you define the mechanism. You, you set the knobs, there is no training, you're just like, okay, well, that's what interpretability is because I know exactly what this neural network is doing. Since this is a homework problem, I leave it as a homework for you. Uh, <laughs> play with it. Uh, uh, it's a, you, 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 you'll have fun uh, one evening at least. So that's doable, but what we want to do, imagine we have this model that is as small as this, we want to go back instead of us setting the parameters to do the task that we want uh, the model to do. So we know what the task is being done uh, and we know what uh, parameters are and how they are added. So we know what is exactly going on. Now the middle part is missing. We know what the task is being done. We need to go like, for example, Mm, we have a game here that has uh, protection in it, and we need to figure out how it realizes uh, copyright protection. So we uh, open up a um, um, hexadecimal editor, disassemble everything, and see. Oh, okay. Well, it's watching for this specific thing. Let's put. Uh, let's put an if then else bypass there or, or remove that part of code. So we want to be able to reverse engineer our model like that. We know what it's doing, but we don't know how it is doing this thing. Imagine it's the same four by uh, two by two neural network as with the recurrent neural networks. So um, slightly more complicated, but very, very simple as the recurrent neural network, as I showed you, is uh, this transformer block that mechanistic interpretability people are working with. 
Why mechanistic interpretability? Because the neural network, the RNN that I showed you, for example, it's just like a clockwork. You're multiplying one matrix, uh, adding bias, multiplying another matrix. So we want to understand exactly what this circuit is doing. So write down the um, transformer block. The embedding is this equation. The attention, uh, self-attention is doing this, MLP is doing that, and then uh, logic, uh, the output of unembedding or you know, decoder, a uh, linear decoder is over there. Now, if we train this on a simple task, now I'm kind of sad that I cannot try it uh, uh, with my uh, pen. If we train it on a simple task, that and it does well, then we should be able to go back, look at this weights and explain or understand how this model, a very simple model, um, just one layer of transformer, one block, achieves uh, the task. That's the goal we'll of mechanistic interpretability. So knowing the ground, well, it's tell us what they're doing conceptually. So we know what they're doing in terms of, oh, it's a linear uh, multiplication. This is, but this is not enough, right? We don't understand what concept this here uh, or ticking through the model realizes. So we, um, uh, want to somehow figure out this uh, transition from, uh, we know mechanistically what they're doing, although they call it mechanistic interpretability, but hey, mechanistically, it's just matrix vector multiplication, and I know exactly what mechanistically, but they actually want to achieve conceptual understanding of what those operations realize on a slightly higher level. So although they're still very low level explanations, we want to get them like, okay, what does this block do? It takes tokens, what does it realize? Uh, what, what is it uh, conceptually? What does this block do conception? We know exactly numerically what it does. Conception, what it does. And the task for now is modular addition. Modular addition is easily uh, visualized with clocks. When you provide it to the model, the model does not have any rotating gear or anything specifically. It's, uh, think transformer, right? There is an um, embedding layer. Uh, there is a uh, self-attention layer and there is MLP. There are skip connections, residual connections, but uh, in this paper, they claim that residual connections didn't have any uh, significant effect. Uh, so that's good, that it's easier to analyze what's going on. Uh, the model, the, what I'm showing on the screen, uh, the, the clock uh, circle, the, the dial, the model doesn't have any mechanism like that. Okay. It's still our good old matrix vector multiplication. Okay, so now we understand what we're trying to do, right? This I have my large audience that <laughs> can give me some feedback. Uh, so but what switching uh, gears, grokking, what, what are we talking about here? So uh, here's a Wikipedia. Grok is a neologism coined by American writer Robert Heinlein in his 1961 science fiction novel, Strangers in Strangeland. If you haven't read it, you probably uh, should. Uh, so, et cetera, et cetera. So it's intuitive understanding. Let's go to a simple um, definition that that go uh, gave me uh, as, a, as a search. If you search to find Grok, that's what you to understand profoundly through intuition or empathy. What um, what I think it really means is, um, so uh, here's an example from child psychology. Um, when, you, when you've got a bunch of kids, like mm, preschoolers or mm, elementary schoolers it, in a complex environment, say scientific lab, and you ex start explaining them stuff, explaining, start uh, broadcasting, practically like oh this is this this is that introducing new complex words uh, suddenly you you see them because of their mirror neurons and because they want to be part of the gang they start using the words that they just heard for this uh, first time and they use those words quite proficiently right and like 
Kids pick up words, new words, just like that. And they may keep using them for a while, but if you try asking them, like actually interrogating them what those words means, you will find out that they have no idea, um, initially at least. And I, like, so the same uh, people will notice people who train uh, kids uh, to solve math problems and stuff. Kids often start solving math problems intuitively much earlier than they are able to realize how they're doing it. So it's like they're, they're going through some kind of a mechanical process, but they don't understand what they're doing and they are unable to explain to you. They, they arrive at the solution faster than you are, but then eventually, and, and if, if you, I think, I, 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 I think if you um, sort of meditate on your life, like when you started learning about some concepts, you were using some concepts before you actually realized um, what the concept is and then later in your professional career, you're like, oh, that's what it's actually doing. That is grokking. It's uh, so grokking um, can intuitively explain grokking in neural networks. So this came up was used in 2022 practically by the same people that wrote this paper that we're looking at. Uh, on the modular, uh, modular division uh, problem, but that was modular addition that we're considering now. This is 2022, so slightly uh, different problem. Look what is happening. The training model, similarly, I will show it on the board uh, because my pen doesn't uh, work. Um, I apologize to the people online. But look what's happening. Validation error is zero once the model practically overfitted on the data set. The accuracy of the model on the training data set jumped like the red curve already jumped. It's 100% almost. And the model is abysmal. It's not, it doesn't, didn't learn anything. What is happening under the hood there that the loss keeps still, still keeps crawling down. So the loss is going down, going down uh, the model is restructuring internal weights. So it still remembers, or quote unquote remembers, or um, it, uh, like you still, the loss is still sensitive. You can still penalize the uh, logits, the weights after softmax, like to be more pronounced. But the accuracy on the training set is already 100%. It already got it, although nothing is happening uh, with the validation. So these weights are eventually uh, changing, 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 and suddenly a huge phase transition, the model realized, quote unquote. The, basically what happens is the model discovers the actual process that needs to be done to get the model, modular division here. And now since it discovered the actual process, it, it's generalizable. So uh, this, this is from the 2022 uh, paper. That's, the grokking phenomena, as I, as I understand, as it was first described, first presented um, in this context. So here's an example from the current paper. So, no, there is no full screen, I think. Oh, there is. No. <laughs> ah, OK. Well, anyways, uh, it's large enough, right? So again, this is um, train loss. The red is train loss and the test loss for the module. This is one single transformer block modular addition in the uh, current paper that uh, is scheduled for today reading club. And um, the same, the loss went down, training loss went down pretty quickly while nothing is happening to the test loss. The model is not realizing. The interesting part for work uh, of Riyasad and uh, uh, people who work on sparsity is that something is happening to uh, the internal model representation as the model starts to understand. It is not an abrupt, but still a phase transition. Um, we'll, we'll come back to it. Um, okay, so, so it would be accurate to say that the loss, the magnitude of the loss, gra the gradient, would be almost zero, but the weights are being updated anyway? No, 
I don't mm -hmm. think so. So not not almost zero. I mean, it's small, but it's still not zero. It's sensitive. Yeah. Uh, the accuracy is insensitive. Accuracy on the test. Uh, oh, sorry. Accuracy on the train is already hundred percent. But mm -hmm. the loss is still like say the model could be more sure when it sees this. Like the logits could be larger on the correct class. That's what it's tweaking. It's like when we take the threshold for the accuracy, we already binarizing it okay the, the answer is already correct it's one is already larger than another but what the loss is doing it's trying to change the weighting further be, between the correct right. and the yeah I, I i think what you're saying kind of makes sense but if these curves are loss curves though right yes they are loss curves so the gradient there's a there's a period where the gradient of the loss is nearly zero, but it's not, I guess it's not zero, but. Not zero, it's tiny, yeah. It's... Okay, say this period starts somewhere here. But perhaps the 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 partial, the, the, the amount of the update of the weight is non-zero, even though the loss is zero, is what I'm trying to say. Yeah, yeah, I think so. Like starting from 14,000 iteration, I think that's what it is here. Starting from 40,000, you can say it's significantly uh, less inclined. Like the loss changes are much smaller than before. And, but the, it's already got it. Like test loss already went down right here. Uh, already is uh, like, so around here where my cursor is, there is almost no signal in the train loss. But the test loss is also quite good by then. Anywhere before, there is some signal in train loss because it's going down. Are we on the same page? I think so. Okay. It's, just yeah. it's just interesting that the that you're having an internal update of weights while the loss is it's not zero, but it's I mean the, the gradient of the loss is not zero, but it's very small. So it's, yeah. Well, this is an old um, discussion with Noah mostly. The value of the loss does not affect the gradient. No, 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 but the gradient is is basically the slope of this curve, right? So like I'm basically oh. I'm doing like a slope idea. No, it's not the slope of this curve. No, loss summarizes the entire uh no, grad uh, gradient is, I'm saying gradient, not the loss. The yeah, gradient. yeah, yeah. Gradient that you use to update your weights have no relationship with the magnitude of the red or the blue curve. But does it have a relationship with the slope? It has a relationship with the slope of the uh, yeah. error surface. This is value of the error at a surface magnitude at a certain point. The uh -huh. slope this 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 the gradient is not the gradient of this red curve has okay. nothing to do with red curve okay it's just the magnitude so think of a, a parabola shifted up shifted down that's all we see is like how high it is we don't see how peaky or how flat the parabola is yes yeah, it's, it's kind of like a projection in, of the what's really going on into two dimensions or something into one dimension basically one number it's just a, like imagine that this is like there is a surface and there is a magnitude of this surface but this magnitude could be the same whether your gradient is large it's a very uh curvy uh, or a steep surface or if the gradient is small if it's a flat surface the magnitude is the same and this is just the magnitude mm -hmm. the loss. okay um I don't have much other visual aids, but the paper, I think. So they're claiming that this behavior that they notice is like um, an, like the model exhibiting rocking. Is that what mm -hmm. they, they'll, they'll show what that would, um, we'll get to, to this figure in the, but in the paper, I'll switch it to the paper. That's so good. Can you define uh, groping? Say again? Can you define groping? I did. Oh, okay. 
basically route learning. But so, uh, well, like this whole section was about broking. I will share my intro slides, but uh, in two words, this is broking. The model is performing well on trained data uh, for a while until it suddenly, like a phase transition, starts performing well everywhere. It, gener it generalizes almost instantaneously on the scale of the training, but not quite, right? This is low curve. It does take time for it to generalize. This is also a misleading curve. Uh, the way it goes up here is much uh, the way the green curve goes up takes much longer than the, the time the red curve goes up because of the logarithmic scale here. So this is much steeper process. But for the story, it's much more sell sellable like that. So the claim here is like that the model is achieving some kind of a like intrinsic understanding of the data? And we'll get to it in the paper. Yeah, I'll okay. get to it in the paper. Yeah, uh, like at first the model basically figures out a way that works for um, uh, uh, what is it? That works for the test uh, train data set but it's not a generalizable way. So if we stopped training driven by accuracy, we, we would be done and we would get a model that doesn't generalize. But the same model, if you keep uh, training it, uh, in order to improve, uh, you know, I could recall here, John Don Livingston Seagal and all of that stuff, like, and how we go through our education by just training to the test, <laughs> uh, but uh, like pass the test, that doesn't mean you understand, but finally when you understand, you suddenly can generalize, but how do you achieve? It's a huge process of working, working, and being penalized for not getting it super, super right. This is, those are mar margins, right? So, like, that, this is all hand waiting, by the way. Like, I'm just trying to interpret what we're seeing. I thought, uh, the, the emergent, uh, I don't know, the grokking, I think, it, is that also like the emergent uh, phenomenon that they were talking about that occurs during training? Like, they mentioned that, like, a lot of models have emergent phenomenon that happen. But anyway, my, when I was reading about it, I was like my mind wandered to like LLMs and like how like they could kind of like start out being kind of stupid and like passively good. But like the longer we train them and the more data we feed them, like it's like this, if there's like phase transitions on like how much they actually understand what they're looking at, that would be pretty interesting to study. But anyway. uh, well, yes, uh, that's kind of, um... Well, let's let's get to it in time. That's kind of what I think they're claiming, but I I have questions basically <laughs> to this story. And then uh yeah. let let's let's talk about um, hand wavingly at first, uh, because I don't have any slides uh, for the progress measures. So this grokking behavior was already observed by the same group in 2022. What what is this paper about? So uh, phase transitions or emergence, uh, okay, uh, not well defined, at least for me. I am unable to uh, define the word emergence, so uh, phase transitions is quite uh, quite simple, right? We have water, we keep changing the temperature, and suddenly the water is solid. And that transition uh, happens pretty fast. You, you need to be really careful to not make it fast. And it's still, be, well, yeah, I guess it still will be fast. So you, you can overcool water while still keeping it liquid, but then the transition will be instantaneous into the solid. So that kind of the phenomena that, that uh, they mean, the phase transition. So one of the, uh, one of the models for phase transition, one of the simplest original models is the Ising model, uh, Ising lens. Yeah, so that was, uh, uh, I think a lens model of magnetization in uh, media. Uh, you take a binary matrix, just a n by n matrix, and uh, think of a one as a dipole pointing one direction. Think of a zero as the like, uh, dipole <coughs> pointing another direction. And so when all of the dipoles are pointing into 
one direction, the, their net magnetization increases because they are constructively combined. If they, e e either direction, when they're fighting with each other, uh, then the net magnetization is low, but they are constantly affecting each other uh, in their neighborhood. And if the temperature of the environment is high, then there are temperature fluctuations that randomly flip the uh, dipoles. And temperature fluctuation is fighting against the dipoles wanting to orient, to correlate, to start. Uh, well, the, the dipoles could also be happy pointing in a, a different direction, I guess, as, as long as they are like, no, I, I must be wrong. They, they, they are tending, they want to uh, point in another direction, in the common direction. So what I'm talking uh, about here, once you start lowering the temperature, if the temperature is high, all the dipoles are clicking back and forth, back and forth. And imagine this binary matrix. I, uh, I had grandiose plans for this talk in the last 20 minutes. I will do all the specializations. I even made ChatGPT generate the code, Python code for me. But yeah, uh, now I'm, I'm left with kind of waiting. So just the binary matrix and black and white dots going up and down, up and down. The, the ones, once you start decreasing the temperature in the equation, it's, a, it's all numerical model. You're running uh, RMCMC and Metropolis casting algorithm to compute uh, the orientation. Um, you get like islands, some of them, the, the closest of them tend to uh, have the same direction, but they're fighting with each other. But at a certain point, like with the freezing of water, there is a phase transition in, in this uh, numerical model that everyone kind of flips uh, into large islands either everyone becomes, uh, the whole matrix becomes white or black, or half of it is white, like a large group, it freezes. Uh, so the question uh, in this paper is like, okay, it's a similar phenomenon. Something happens with the weights of the model so that they are not inclined to change anymore. But can we predict that or can we track that? Turns out in the Ising model, you can track uh, magnetic, so uh, susceptibility, I think I'm pronouncing it right. Yeah, it kind of reminds me of like Conway's game of life where they have like the different emergency behaviors, I guess, in that little... Yeah, but there is no phase transition in Conway's game of life. Yeah, yeah but it's it's a one of the type of cell or automata, or only it's more of a physical model. I think model is not, like it, it, it doesn't, it's not governed by generations and rules, mm -hmm. precise rules. It's not a cell or automaton. It's a like a like the microwave. Put it on a little hot spot. Sorry. Say again? It's like a hot pocket in the microwave. There's one little hot spot. Sorry. Uh, so I, the, <laughs> I was trying to... So Ising model, Ising model is not... Uh, something that you've heard of uh, there's so. three three um phase transitions that are two of which are probably actually relevant to, to the brain stuff that we look at in the fMRI maybe like um when in my master's degree but I was told that the the epilepsy the follow like the transition from the ictal to like pre ictal to ictal or whatever seizure state is is like a phase transition and then um i've heard that like uh meditation uh is somewhat of a phase transition potentially and then the pseudoscience is like i've heard that like people claim that like group meditation is also like a phase transition and that, that people kind of like align like these dipoles but anyway so phase transition is very common in physics uh, uh like that's in our um, metals and steels uh like they, they, they work thanks to phase transitions that we can anneal the metal and get it to a different uh, chemical, not structural composition, although the chemical composition is the same. Like the phase diagrams are, are common as well. So I would, sorry, William, I would try to stick to physical phenomena for now. Just, and also it's simpler uh, with the uh, uh, Ising model uh, correspondence. Like this Ising model could be like your a diagram of uh, iron and uh, carbon. You're showing me a warshacked of a uh, of white matter, I think, in 2D. Like I've been looking at brains too much. 
okay. I'm, I'm thinking of metal more than, yeah. But this is the Ising, Ising model, uh, 500 by 500 binary matrix. And it starts with high temperature, as you saw, everything is random and then the temperature decreases. But why am I talking about it? I'm talking about it because we want to know when this tra phase transition will happen, when it will stop, when it will um, crystallize. And um, it, uh, so fluctuations in magnetization, they peak at phase transition. So you can track a group metric uh, uh, and then you know, oh, okay, it goes up and then this is the phase transition. Now the model has learned, right? We want something like that for our neural network. Is there a metric like that that uh, you know can uh, enable it. Uh, us tr uh, tracking. At first, in the paper, finally, we've seen this already. This is our single uh, block of uh, transformer. The claim is that, and you've seen it's all linear algebra. Sort of with slight non nonlinearity. Non the claim in the paper is that the model, after training, like a finally, finally, after training, learns to do the following operations. First, it takes A and B. A and B are one hat encoded. In, uh, if the task is modular arithmetic, uh, say 12, like the uh, hours, then A and B are 12 element binary vector with one at which number it is, right? It's mm -hmm. all integers. But the model takes A and uh, represents it as a sign with uh, corresponding frequency. So as I understand, the frequency should correspond to that 12 or whatever uh, circle. Uh, so like with the clock, different uh, modulus, uh, the, 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 the different value of the uh, um, period, I guess, uh, for the modular arithmetic uh, will be defining the frequency here, the, the W. So A uh, is represented as sine W A and W and cosine W A and uh, B, etc. Then the self-attention figures out this uh, trigonometric identity itself, just training by example, it figures out that it needs to do this trigonometric identity. Look, there is a remixing in self function. Each value is remixed uh, by the weights with each other value. And that's, a, that's the claim that it, um, what is happening. Self-attention calculates sine and cosine of this frequency times the sum A plus B and A plus B. Then, and uh, uh, maybe it's together self attention. Okay, self attention and MLP looking by uh, this bar here, and then uh, unembedding uh, kind of undoes this operation or recovers, uh, it figures out another uh, trigonometric identity that can go from this representation sine and cosine of the sum into the representation of uh, cosine of the sum minus uh, some constant c. So I, I guess this constant the model uh, yeah the model figures it out. Oh, c is a constant for each of the uh, period I guess mod p like we're, we're doing arithmetic mod p and so we have uh, P outputs from zero to P minus one. And uh, C is a specific constant for each of these logits. C is your logit in the output from zero to P. How they demonstrated that the model learns that, I'm still not too certain, but uh, this is the claim. I'm, I'm imagining that uh, the first author spent a lot of hours just by sitting in the hex, equivalent of a hex, the editor, by looking at the weights and trying to figure out what they're doing and came up with this hypothesis. One of the observations that helped him to come up with this hypothesis is periodicity in the attention head. 
see it's uh, the uh, in the attention scores. Uh, the attention weights and attention scores are uh, periodic in uh, different head activations for head zero for neuron zero in our oh, neuron will be in the MLP. So they noticed or he's noticed uh, periodicity in the weight, periodicity in the activations. And uh, that led him, as I understand, to this uh, idea that it's doing a modular arithmetic on the circle. It figured it figured out the clockwork um, representation of modular modular arithmetic. Then uh, what uh, they were tracking. Uh, what they were tracking is different uh, parameters for all of the weights. Um, I promised a messy talk, so it is messy. It was structures, mechanisms, uh, periodicity in the embeddings. Yes, uh, uh, they took Fourier transform along the input. So, so when you take Fourier transform, you get the frequency. So they see periodicity, they take Fourier transform to get the frequency of that periodicity. And then let's go back to this. They were able to see that this um, Fourier transform, the, um, the Fourier transform um, results are changing the more you train the model. At first, all frequencies like white noise, but then as the model gets more trained, some winners emerge. So if, if there would be only one frequency, it's like, okay, there is only one dial. It, the model is operating only on one dial, one circle of a fixed period. But uh, once the model learn, okay, there are five, six, seven, maybe seven uh, frequencies. Seven, it uses uh, basically just seven dials and suppresses all the other frequencies. But so kind of on a basis of sinusoids. Is that right? Uh, so can you say it again, William? Uh, is, it, is it sort of like learning a, a basis set of sinusoids? Yeah, I mean, it's it's equivalent, yeah. Um, those are sinusoids in the real uh, space and in the frequency space, they are just delta functions. Yes, you're right. Um, but uh, back to this uh, figure. Interesting how that works. Back to this figure. They're figuring out those Ws and I guess those Ws in different attention heads. Uh, like what will they be? And those those frequencies are the values of those Ws. So the basis sine cosine with this W is the uh, basis functions that William is uh, talking about. Once you set the W, you get uh, cosine of certain frequency and those phase shift stages. Uh, for the previous uh, graph that you showed, is there a sudden uh, decline? The previous one, yes, that one. Look at the blue one, right? It it blue is the test. It doesn't know, doesn't know, like doesn't generalize. It's like suddenly it generalized. I mean, relatively sudden. It, okay. it takes. But the red one should uh, have a sudden decline, right? Right. Yeah. The red one learned everything at once. And and. Uh, that graph uh, on the left should uh, we should see the drop it happens okay let's look at here the drop will happen from here right it starts happening so the, uh, uh, the, this is a good the, this is a good uh, question so the first part should be declined i mean when uh, our red curve is declining no it lead okay that, uh, that, not necessarily so what the let me find their paragraph i think yeah it's a good observation let's ignore that for a second there was a sentence are you here uh, in the beginning, it did not figure out. So they 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 um, 
single out three stages, memorization, circuit formation, and cleanup. Circuits is their uh, magic word that they're using in this mechanistic interpretability over time. So at first, right here, the model just memorized the train set. It didn't figure out the circuit that is generalizable. It's just like, oh, okay, I can figure out how to do it. So it without using the modular arithmetics, I, kids, as kids, when we learn, we do that, right? It just memorized uh, the, the, the train set. That's the first stage. And then while we keep penalizing it, there is no generalization. But the model eventually, like those uh, on the left, the frequencies emerge. The model eventually figures out or starts figuring out the actual algorithm, the algorithm that we can um, relate to each other. And once it's figured out actual algorithm, it's still dirty. Like um, the, those, it's not, if you go in and set the weights to this RNN manually, you will get a very, the, from my example, you have a very clean mechanism that doesn't have any uh, uncertainty, any, there is no noise there. But if you start training, there will be some noise, your weight, like before it gets to your weights, the weights will be 0 0.8 instead of one and stuff like that. So that's the kind of noise. So it figured it out, but still it makes mistakes because of that noise. So this next phase they call cleanup, when it pushes all the values to the right values and all of the other values, which should be zero, it pushes them down, say, or down. at least in the frequency space. This is the frequency space. This is not the weights. The way, what happens in the weights is more smooth. So like the, the, the dual spaces, the frequency space, anything that is sharp and sparse in frequency space is um, smooth and uh, all covering or covers a lot of ground in the uh, real space and reverse. In the uh, real space, anything that's sharp meets all of the frequencies. So in frequency, it becomes sparse, but the waves do not become sparse. The waves become smoother, like uh, with the basis functions. Uh, so sinusoids are more pronounced than the way the, the periodicity is there. So, question. Yes. Uh, what? Go back to that uh, slide, if you don't mind. The re the the figure. Uh, why do you think that they rise in pairs, like the blue and the red peak at the same time? Uh, the sines and the cosines with the same omegas. I'm. Those are sure. measurements, right? Oh, those are. I think it's not the weights; it's the activations. FFT of the activations. So they measure uh, the activation mm -hmm. on. Uh, uh, train and on test. Okay. Because potentially they could be different. The examples are different. The the arithmetic uh, problems, the uh, addition problems are different. Mm -hmm. so they're not. They're not using test and train. They kind of separate. Okay. Let me quickly go through the last um, like their idea. So basically, one way or another, they manage to demonstrate that. Their hypothesis here, this this is the algorithm that this little circuit is doing. Uh, that it uh, it's it's convinced the reviewers. It's sort of on my scheming and reading the paper makes sense. Um, I'm I'm sure you can figure the figure it out. But the point of the paper is not that this has been observed before. The point of the paper is what can we track in order to be able to predict that without going imagine we have um this is one circuit just two numbers two tokens at a time well three actually the equal uh equal sign uh is the third token but who cares two tokens a and b uh, are entering but if we have multi-layer uh transformer much wider with thousands of tokens um, you can hire, I mean, maybe you can hire uh, some engineers with hex editors, just like, you know, th this doesn't scale. This process just th doesn't look like it scales, that we can figure out what each part of a transformer is doing by looking at the entire transformer at once. If you, uh, like, 
going by the two examples, one, one, one also good thing uh, that uh, of this paper that goes against the tradition of deep learning a little bit, but back to the tradition of the science is toy models. This is a toy model of uh, you know large uh, potential effect. Uh, the critique is that oh it may not scale, but um, the flaw is we would never be able would have been never uh, we would have never been able to figure this out from a, a large model what it is doing. Here at least we're like hey it is figuring out the actual mechanical uh, circuits. That's why they use circuits, that we know how they work, we understand what it works. But what they're actually trying in this paper is to come up with something like magnetic uh, susceptibility, this average measure that, would they, that we would track of the network that would be able to tell us, okay, the phase transition is happening. Let me show you my other slide uh, here. So how do you know where to stop? It's like, okay, this is validation, that, that's okay, but if you only have the training error, or if your validation set is not representative and it kind of started uh, curving up earlier, but actual generalization hadn't yet happened. So that's what they're trying to figure out. Is there a, a metric, a curve that we can track? And this part, I... Uh, don't know. Let me quickly read it while we... Progress measures, restricted loss, excluded loss. Okay, two progress measures that they come up with. They're with restricted and excluded loss. I think, uh, William, you said you read it. Did you figure out what the restricted loss and uh, if you can help me, I'm still trying to figure out. Ah, uh, no, I'm sorry, I didn't. Uh, that one, yeah. Only there's few frequencies. Oh, okay, this is like an ablation study, okay. So what they're doing is the model is trying to come up uh, to promote certain frequencies in that Fourier transform. So what they do, they suppress artificially all of the other frequencies once they see the winners emerge and see what happens. And the uh, excluded loss, it's the opposite. They suppress the the frequencies that the model is trying to promote and look at what the magnitudes that is happening with the other uh, frequencies. Uh, yes. Look at this e e excluded loss. Instead of keeping important frequencies, we remove only those frequencies from the logits, uh, but keep the rest. So that, that's what they're tracking and uh, going back to the figure. Excluded loss and restricted loss. Okay, so the claim is, look at this bump, like the maximum of excluded loss corresponds to the time when the cleanup uh, stage has started. So it's kind of like, okay, now the model figured it out and now it's starting the cleanup, the red goes down. But the restricted loss sort of corresponds, maybe not as well. Uh, the minimum corresponds to the stage when the model finished the cleanup, and that's it. It's not going to do much after that. So that's if you're tracking those excluded and restricted loss, maybe you can capture that cleanup, uh, the start of the cleanup period. At least this is all again a caveat. Uh, this is all a toy model. We do not know, or at least I don't know, not from this paper, uh, that the same thing is happening in real uh, large models training on uh, on real tasks to us. But at least we can um, uh, be guided by this finding. So to conclude, we're out of time. To conclude, uh, this is an interesting approach, mechanistic interpretability, where you actually go with, in my uh, uh, view hex editor inside of the network and looking at all of the uh, binary values that it outputs, uh, trying to figure out how it works. And then uh, you can claim, oh, okay, this is a transistor with uh, these parameters. Oh, this one realizes, uh, I don't know, uh, LC circuit with these parameters. And then we can map the entire neural network like that. Not that it helps. If I look at 
the circuits. I don't understand what they're doing anyways, but maybe it's getting us closer to uh, trustworthiness, the way we can test our electronics and trust them. Maybe we can map uh, the functions that the neural network learns like that, and at least um, uh, doing a second order analysis by uh, logic, some logical um, programming, like uh, guarantee or not guarantee that they will be within the bounds, or at least to understand their bounds. That's my understanding of this mechanistic interpretability. But the entire science, we, if we understood the brain like that, uh, but, well, okay, we want at different levels, right? We understand the neuron, but we do not understand how the neuron creates consciousness or creates our behavior. We understand behavior as well. We can show advertisement that people will follow and do what we want. Uh, but we don't understand how neurons go uh, from one way. So this is like understanding neurons um, to me, like low level understanding, but slightly higher level than just like matrix algebra. So I think we're done. Thanks uh, for those who connected and thanks for coming. We have Zain. So, it to ourselves. so the less so there's no restrict so there's like I guess instantaneous I guess learning so no restricted loss and that's the that's the grogging uh, line I think right. Uh, when it so starts grogging, yeah. Uh, uh, I'm not sharing anymore. Let me share again. Do you, what do you mean? With the the um the curve that actually um. Complete uh, understands the algorithm. I guess they use the word circuit. This is the red, right? So that would mean so yeah, the red is fast loss. loss. So the restricted loss is just a little. Um, the green is restricted loss. The green, oh, okay. The, the, the this restricted loss, yeah, the green. Okay. Yeah, yeah that's restricted. Yeah. I'm kind of curious how this might, if it all relate to like adversarial behavior when you like show. Uh, no one network like an adversarial example when it fails so badly. If, um, um, I don't know. But, well, maybe it did not learn the algorithm then. Yeah. Just, like the actual, or or maybe there are multiple algorithms. I'm calling uh, algorithms um, you know, uh, just to have something um, to assign to it. But the me mechanical things that lead to prediction, maybe there may be many. Um, and I think we exercise many as well. Like even the way you add numbers, there are multiple algorithms to add numbers, right? Or division, uh, like in different countries, it's learned differently and et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. Isn't there state dependent learning? Like if you take like uh, caffeine or something and you learn something, you're more likely to remember it if you drink caffeine and that, that sort of thing. Uh, yeah, let's put transformers on caffeine. Well, but that's kind of the noise, but we need probabilistic models, I guess. Yeah. That's what uh, the Ali Kono is arguing for. for, arguing for. Okay, uh, thanks everyone. See you next week. Uh, and yeah, it's all, all in the schedule, right? Yes. Thanks, John. I will share the video.